Good to see you, everybody tonight. Had a good time. So Wendy, who got wet, got a little bit wet there. Uh, okay, yeah, he didn't pass out the offering. So if you had something that you need to put in there, you could just uh, throw it over there. Yeah, thanks, brother. Okay, so uh, uh, you got a little print out there. I, I got wet. Oh, I forgot I was going to tell you. So I got wet, but my wife drove up and said, here, here's an umbrella. It was pink. I couldn't use it. I couldn't use it, man. I, I remember hearing this preacher one time say his wife accidentally washed his white underwear in with the reds. And his underwear came out pink. And he's like, I ain't wearing those. And his wife said, what? Nobody's going to see them. And he said, I know they're pink. He said, and what happens if I got in a wreck or something like that? And I had to go to the hospital and they saw I had pink underwear. I ain't going to wear it. And he said, not only that, but God knows I have. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Uh, I'm not really that that hardcore about, you know, some people are like, you got a pink shirt, you know, they're like, oh, they're sissies or something like that. You can wear a pink shirt. I won't, I won't make too much fun of you. It might just tease with you a little bit. And you'll say it's salmon, but we all know it's pink. All right, so <laughs> you should have a handout now. Braden's passed out. If everybody, if he didn't get one, ask Braden. And I, I don't know why I did the. I accidentally printed it sideways. I don't know if that'll throw you off or not, but that's the way I usually print my notes that I preach off of. And I just forgot, and I printed yours that way, and so it uh, fits in my Bible well. But anyway, yeah, I'm sure you'll figure it out. Continuing a series on ministering to children. Okay, last week we just kind of did an introduction, introduction on the, purpose, the point of ministering to children, how important it is and all that, why we do it, and some just different thoughts on that. And so we're going to continue on that uh, this evening. And first thing you see in your notes there is, uh, to some degree, it seems like some people, at least, never grow up. You ever, <laughs> you've met those folks and they never grow up. Uh, some uh, wives like to make jokes about how they just, with their husband, they just got another kid in the house, right? Because he never grew up. I hope that's not the case, but uh, certainly it seems like in our society, it seems to be popular for people to just stay like their kids, and not grow up, and oftentimes uh, they'll be they'll live their fan their not fantasies, uh, but their their remembrances of whenever they were a child. And this guy, you know, 300 pounds, sitting on the couch, eating chips and all that stuff, watching the football game, and all he can remember is back whenever he was like the star quarterback or something, <laughs> you know. And is and that everything we want to talk about, just all the time, get together with their old buddies from high school and talk about all these times. And it's like, man, grow up. You're not that anymore. You're a man. Be a man. But sometimes that's it. And, and, and a lot of times the women think back to, you know, uh, their cheerleader days or maybe days that they, well, they don't think that. <laughs> or they think that they uh, 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 are, uh, uh, you know, if they were boy crazy, you know, back in high school days, then sometimes they grow up and they're still like that, you know, and they still. And I've noticed even this a lot of times. Uh, ladies, they reach a certain point, men too, I guess, but ladies reach a certain point and it's like they want to go back. Like you, you grew, you're younger, you want to be older. And then all of a sudden you reach this point and they're like, man, I wish I was young again. And some ladies start dressing like they were like they're teenagers again. And it, it just kind of, it's weird. You know, why do you want to be like that? Why do you want to be a little, or why, how about this? Why, why would a husband want his daughter to be like a teenager again? <laughs> Right? Uh, I mean, why would a husband, what did I say? Why would a husband want his wife to be like his daughter? You know what I mean? And that's kind of crazy, but that's how it is. And guys too, man. I see guys walking around 60 years old. He's got skinny jeans on, ponytail, or, or what, a man bun or something like that. And you're like, come on, man, grow up. Right? But this happens. The Bible says we should grow up. Here's another thing. Uh, the second point there, I've got you a blank. It says, there's always a child that surfaces in certain situations. Now, I believe that's true. There are certain times our child will speak, right, to someone else's child. Does that make sense? Or, or you know, maybe a child will be speaking to you, and you ever notice when they start trying to act like an adult, and it's like they're uh, the adult in that child is trying to be, you know, he's trying to be an adult, and sometimes we can fall back and be like children in different ways. It's natural. It's normal. It's kind of within us uh, to hold on to that. And one place it really comes out, and I was thinking about this, is, uh, and here's your blank here, arguing with a child. 
arguing with a child. I remember watching this. Uh, you ever seen the hidden camera? Uh, they take a video and they like hide this camera and the person doesn't know that they're being filmed and so they make some kind of, you know, uh, a prank, pull some kind of prank on them or something like that. Well, this was sort of like that, but this was actually a study. And these teenage girls, uh, were, they, they would go, and they, they were act, actresses, of course, but they would just go sit on this park bench or something where maybe some lady was on her phone. I'm talking about an adult lady. And they'd start, you know, just acting like typical teenagers, and they're gossiping and all that stuff. And then they would say something kind of rude to the lady sitting there. And after a while, she's overhearing them acting like that. And, uh, and she's getting kind of offended, and all of a sudden they get into an argument. And it was so funny because almost always these ladies would just start acting like a teenager in the way that they argued with the, these teenagers and, and all that stuff. Look, man, don't ever get caught up in that. Ar don't argue with a young person and become a young person. Remain the adult, right? We're supposed to grow up and uh, put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul says this, When I was a child... I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so we see right there that this is something that I, I, we all should desire to do, is that means we're going to reach a point in our life where we begin to speak differently than we did as children. We're going to reach a point where we need to understand things differently than we did as w when we were children. And we need to think about things differently than we did. That's what uh, Paul is saying right there. It's something to keep in mind. You know, we got to remind ourselves sometimes, I'm supposed to be the adult here. I'm supposed to be uh, growing up and putting away childish things. But that also should remind us that when we see a child, you know, they're heading a certain direction. One day, I mean, don't push them to grow up too fast. You understand they got to go through a process. But one day they're going to reach adulthood. And, and, and we're teaching them that. I remember telling little kids uh, when they'd come into the adults, adult uh, class and they were used to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and children's church and all that stuff. And they'd come in the adult class and you can see them just like, oh, I don't want to be here. All right. And I would say, look, you don't appreciate it now, but one day you're going to have to be an adult. And so it's good for you to learn how to sit there and learn how to listen to some of this and all that. And, uh, you know, a lot of them didn't get it, of course. But look, as a parent, that's what we're trying to do is direct our children in that place to where one day they'll become adults. And so obviously we ought to set the example and become adults ourselves so they can see what an adult is supposed to be like. So last week when I began the lesson, we talked about how the ultimate goal, uh, uh, how a ch child is ultimately going to be held accountable before God. You know, we tend to think, and, it, it, and I understand the responsibility of training a child rests on those parents who had the child, right? That should be their main responsibility. But that child is going to be accountable to God. No matter what, God is going to be working in their hearts, and He's going to be holding them accountable for the actions that they do, whether they had a good upbringing, good parents, whether their parents separated, whether they were raised in the foster care I'm um, counseling a couple at, uh, in Iola right now, uh, getting, going through some marriage counseling. And both of them had pa a past where the parents weren't involved. Uh, the lady uh, grew up in, in foster care, didn't have a dad around, didn't know her, her dad at all. And I can't remember the situation with the guy, but his is similar. And, and I'm saying, hey, this is, a hard, this is, a, is not the ideal situation. All right, because I'm trying to show you uh, how to be husband and wife, and you don't have, you didn't, weren't raised with an example of that. All right, it's the way God designed it is that uh, a, ch a child will be under the father's authority, and the father will protect them, provide for them, uh, instruct them, show them how to be adults. And when the daughter gets to a certain age and she's ready to get married, he's going to. Take her and say, okay, I trust this guy. She's no longer under my authority. I think this guy will be able to lead her the right direction and take care of her, provide for her, all that. And then he steps back, and it's a perfect way that it works, okay? But when someone had, hadn't had that background, nobody ever trained them, and then they just go into the marriage. They a lot of times have trust issues, and, they, and, the, and they, a lot of times they end up in divorce because they can't trust each other, and, and they don't understand what a man uh, the role of the man and all that kind of stuff. And so it's, an ideal, it's not an ideal situation. We ought to be setting the example so that our kids grow up. They don't have those obstacles. They're still going to be accountable 
you know, to God, no matter what their upbringing was like, but we want to set examples and help them so they don't have a, a, a harder time with that. Okay, so we talked about that a little bit. And now, and then we left off saying, so what is the church's responsibility in helping in these areas? So I want to look at that and see how can the church help with, uh, you know, what is our responsibility? How far do we go in helping to uh, uh, minister to children? And so here's what we're going to do. I'm only going to get through the first two today. And we're going to divide these up into four different groups. So the first one we would call just babies, you know, like the youngest uh, infants and toddlers. And let me just go down the list first, and then I'll come back and fill in those blanks for you. The second would be younger children, you know, so you just think these are no longer babies, not crawling around, not toddlers. They're thinking, talking, uh, you know, uh, sp speaking on their own, making sense and uh, thinking about things. And then they get to the point where they're preteens. And then I'm going to take that all the way up to just early teens. And then something should happen around that time where they're in their late teens to being a young adult and they're ready to move on and to uh, 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 be the head of their own household. So let me fill in those blanks now. I decided to, to alliterate here. So they all start with R, okay? First is the first group, infants and toddlers. This is a time of receiving, all right? They're receiving everything. It's given to them. They don't really have a choice. They don't know what they need in life, you know, so the parents are going to give it to them and they're just going to trust that everything that they're receiving, you know, is what they need. And uh, so it's a time of receiving. And when they pass that stage uh, to young children, I would say that would be a time of realizing, okay, realizing uh, they're starting to understand things and, and realize, you know, how things work. And uh, they know that if they do certain things, it's going to hurt them. And so they've learned not to do certain things. They're making judgments on their own. They're realizing. By the time they get to preteens to early teens, you probably understand this. It's a time of rejecting. <laughs> so they received all this stuff. It was just given to them. It was handed down to them. You know, then they start understanding these things, making sense of it. Then they get to this point in preteens, early teens. Sometimes it lasts a lot longer than that, but early teens where they just start rejecting things and not necessarily rejecting everything. And this isn't necessarily all bad. We a lot of times tease, you know, teenagers of being just, you know, thinking they know it all. And, and obviously that's wrong, but uh, they, they, they think that they know it all and they start just kind of rejecting. Like everything you say, they want to believe the opposite or they want to like come from an opposing uh, viewpoint. Uh, and so that happens a lot of times. Maybe you went through that phase in your life. I don't know. But a lot of times these preteens will hit this time of rejecting. And what they're doing is they're learning how not everything that's been handed down to them is right. Can we all agree upon that? Not everything that our parents taught us was right. Right? That's not disrespectful to your parents. It's just the, it's just the fact of the matter. Not, don't care how godly of a home you grew up in. Not everything was right. That's just, that, none of us are perfect, all right? Not everything doctrinally, spiritually that we were taught is right, you know? Not every idea and ideology that they had was passed down to us was just the perfect thing. And so somewhere in our teens, we start thinking, wait a minute, like, I know that my mom and dad actually aren't perfect, all right? Now, if you're not a preteen yet, forget what I said, all right? <laughs> Mom and dad are perfect. <laughs> but no, you hit a stage where you're like, wait a minute, they make mistakes. Right? How do I know that what they believe is true? How do they know? And at this stage, they really start wondering that and they start questioning that. And, and, and it seems like they're rejecting things. And we have to understand that that's what they're going through. It's not necessarily a bad thing. They need to learn how to come up with these thoughts on their own because at some time your beliefs have to actually be their beliefs, not just it's been handed down to me. I'm just saying this because this is what my mom, mom and dad said, but they actually have to believe it for themselves. And so we need to help them get through that time uh, to the next point where they're in their late teens and up to early adulthood. They're finishing high school, maybe going off to college or trade school or learning what their career is, apprenticeship or something like that. And I would say it's a time of representing Okay, they're representing themselves, but not only that, parents, when we train our kids and then we get to that point where we're re ready to send them off into the world, right, they are learning how to uh, carry on our name, <laughs> really, so we hope that that would be the case, and so looking forward to talking about some of those 
uh, times right there, but receiving, realizing, rejecting, representing, and so uh, that's, the, that's the order we're going to go in. We'll just cover the first two in this lesson. So number one, the infant and toddler stage, the time of receiving. And so our text that Brother Justin already read, Luke 18, look at verse 15. Luke 18, 15. I love that this story is in the Bible. It really helps us know uh, how Jesus thought of and handled young children. Verse 15 says, and he's talking about the disciples here. They brought unto him also infants. Now, other places it says young, ch uh, young children, and I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, if that's a different story or not. Uh, but here it actually says infants, okay? They called unto him. Uh, I'm sorry. And when his disciples saw it, all right? Uh, when, it's, when it talks about the children, it says that they brought him before Jesus. Okay, but when it talks about the infants uh, in here, it actually says, uh, let me see, how did it say in here? Uh, is this where it says they put him on his, they put him on his lap? I can't remember. That might, that might be in, uh, in Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all, all have this story to some degree. Anyway, let's just keep reading. It says, And he brought un, unto him uh, that he would touch them, but when his disciples saw it, they rebuked, them, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. I'm sorry, I'm telling you backwards. This is the one that says little child. I, I meant to take you to where it says infants. Okay, but... He is, uh, he is definitely showing how young children, little children, uh, are there. He has a spot for them. You know the, 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 the way that it was in those times, and it still is in many cases. Sometimes there's, there's this mindset, and, uh, and there, there's a place for this mindset, okay, where the par parents or adults say to the, about the children, they say uh, their children are supposed to be seen and not heard. You ever heard that? They're supposed to be seen and not heard. So you're at the dinner table and all the adults are having a conversation and a child pipes up. Sometimes it's like, hey, you're the child. You're not supposed to be talking. You let the adults talk or whatever. And there's that kind of idea. And so that was kind of the attitude. They were like, hey, can Jesus touch my children? And, and the disciples are like, he doesn't have time for the children. Come on, you see all these adults that are, are trying to get his attention? And so Jesus stops them. Now, I know somebody probably found that by now. Who, who found where it says infants? Anybody find that verse? I saw some people looking, I thought. Okay, never mind. Uh, I, huh? Verse 15, says that. Oh, it does? Man, I'm just messing this all up. Forget, forget that then. So these little children are infants. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so you understand the idea. Thank you for that. Sorry. Uh, so you understand this idea that Jesus is saying, he's showing his tenderness towards these little children. And he's saying, look, Suffer them not to come unto me. Don't prevent them from coming unto me. And then he says this. He says, not only do I care about these children, but really you could learn a lesson from these children. Okay? Such is the kingdom of God. He says, if you receive the kingdom of God like one of these little children, right? If, I mean, if you do not receive the kingdom of God as one of these children, uh, then you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So we know this. We know this. When we preach the gospel... And somebody says, well, that's just easy believism. That's too easy. What do we often say? We say, well, when we preach the gospel, somebody ought to be able to, a little child ought to be able to receive that, right? right. And really, an, an adult, sometimes it's harder for them to receive that because they don't have that childlike faith. Right. So you preach them the gospel and they're just like, well, I just don't know about that. A little child wouldn't be that way. And who's one a little child to the, to the Lord? It's easy, isn't it? Yeah. So easy that you almost get scared. Like, what if they didn't really believe? What if they, you know? But look, they should be able to just receive it. They're children. They don't have these inhibitions and these things that are hindering from that. When we get older, we start building those inhibitions. We start hearing stories. We start. How many times has someone said to you, well, I don't know. I know this person that claimed to be a Christian, and then they just went and lived this backslid and just rebellious life. And you're like, so? <laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to say? There's no way they could still be saved if they're living like that. And I'm like, Jesus said if you just accept him, childlike faith, you know, uh, then you can be saved. And so he says you can learn a lesson, you know, from this. And so uh, he uses this example of, of infants or little children. Sorry, I messed that up. But anyway, 
So this is uh, true all the way up through their teen years, yes, that they are dependent on what we give them uh, for, for in many ways. They're relying on what their parents do for them, what their parents uh, teach them. It is our responsibility as they're growing to protect them and all that kind of stuff. And this is why we are to protect all the way up until their teens. We're supposed to protect children from predators. That's your blank right there. From false teaching, from themselves sometimes and, the, and their self-destructive ways or the things they want to do. We want to protect them. And so it would be you know, so careless for somebody to just see a little child and they're doing something that's going to harm them and just say, well, I don't really care about that, right? It should be our desire to protect those children. This is why Jesus says, look, if anybody, you know, uh, would treat one of these children bad, it's better that a millstone be hung around his neck and he's cast into the sea. Jesus is saying, look, you don't mess with one of my children. That's what he says in the other uh, uh, context where they tell a similar version of that story. Okay, so we should love children so much. And Jesus gives us an example of that. We should love children so much and re recognize their innocence, recognize the fact that they're so impressionable, right? And we should be very careful that not, we're not planting anything in their mind that's going to lead them to a bad road, you know, or, or, or God forbid. I mean, this is why we would say, hey, if somebody molests a child or does something like that, they deserve to die, right? Because you're thinking, and that's what Jesus said, right? If you cast them into the sea. Because, man... That's that's here's the thing. Uh, I've heard a lot of people agree, that would agree with this to some degree when a child is abused that way or molested or whatever. Look, they can't ever get that back right there for the rest of their life. And so I've heard some people say it would be better if they killed them. Then they molested them or did certain things because now they're going to live with that the rest of their life and it's going to cause problems. Now, look, we know children can come out of those bad situations and they can they can follow the Lord and all that. But, man, can you imagine that person that abused a child, you know, and they're standing before God and they're trying to give account of 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 their actions and all that kind of stuff. And and man, there's like a. You know, I, I don't know how the degrees of hell works, but man, there's like a hotter place or something like that in hell for people that would abuse children, you know. And so I think it's so important that we understand Jesus had this soft spot for these children and said, whoa, 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 don't stop them from coming to me, you know. And if he would say that, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but if he would say that in this, do you think he's changed? Has Jesus changed just because he's no longer in the flesh on this earth no, I believe he's still working on children's hearts. And that's why I say a child is going to give an account to God for their own actions, no matter what their parents do, because God is still working in their hearts and working in their lives. And he's calling unto them no matter what their upbringing was. And this is why a child can be in a bad situation and still come out of it. God has a soft spot in his heart for these children, especially the fatherless and such. All right, it's too easy for a child to be deceived. Too easy for a child to be deceived. And we're just talking about how you know impressionable they are, how easy it is they accept things with childlike faith. Well, look, if they'll accept the truth that easily, won't they accept the lie just as easily? They will. You can convince a child anything. You can convince a child that an elf sits on the shelf and watches them, and if they're bad, they're not going to get gifts uh, uh, at Christmas time, right? Man, I get so mad when parents teach their kids those kinds of things. <laughs> that kid's going to grow up and think, it's all just a lie. Santa Claus is a lie. Elf on the shelf is a lie. The Easter bunny is a lie. All these things are a lie. I bet you Jesus is a lie. But he's not a lie. So they need to receive the truth, and they need to be taught at an early age. Hey, no, no, that's bad for you. Don't do that. That's a, and, and be protected from those types of things because it's so easy for them to be deceived. So we as a church want to protect, I mean, help the parents. Uh, it's ultimately their job, obviously, to guard them and protect them. So we want to help the parents to be able to do that in any way that we can. We certainly don't want to as a church. And uh, I think a lot of churches, when they start children's ministries, they have good intentions. I understand that. I understand they have this motive. Like, man, we need to start these different ministries and help the kids and, and put them into all these different age groups where they can learn something at their level and they can be, you know, have some fun and do all these kinds of things. And, and there, uh, all these ministries start with good intentions. And then you find out that right at church, 
some predator creeps in and abuses kids or some false teacher is teaching a kid in a Sunday school class and nobody knows that he's teaching them false doctrine. Right. And then they grow up with these false doctrine. I've watched kids go, even good families, what I would think were good families in a good church, but because of the teaching in Sunday school, maybe not even necessarily doctrine out of this, but they're watching the lifestyle of those who they admire and the other teens that are coming in and they're being affected by that. And the, even though their family loves the Lord and is trying their best to raise the kids in a good environment, they have so much influence in the church that they're, that they're involved in that when they reach teen years and this late teen uh, period of their life, they just totally fall away from the Lord. Right? And you're saying, how did that happen? I mean, the parents were, well, here's what happened. The parents were, relieved, were li relieving themselves of their responsibility to train the kids and they were letting the Sunday school teachers train the kids, letting the youth pastor train the kids, letting the pastor train the kids. And that's the same philosophy of public school. Oh, I, don't, I don't know how to teach my kids. Here, I'll put them in the public school and let them teach them. They know they, they're more educated than I am. They can teach my kids. And they teach them all kind of garbage and lies. And, and, and they grow up, you know, uh, uh, Brother Jeff and I and Iola were knocking on doors and we met this guy that said he was an atheist. And he said, I used to go to church. I used to believe in the Bible and all that kind of stuff. I became an atheist. And I said, mind if I ask what, what changed your mind on that? Because sometimes people will say, well, I just looked around at all the death and destruction and people dying. And maybe I lost a loved one or something like that. And I said, I just don't believe in God anymore. You've heard that kind of stuff. His answer really just kind of shocked me. Uh, I said, well, what do you think changed your mind on that? And he said, probably school. <laughs> He's saying once I got into school and they started teaching me out of the, uh, the books and there was no God in those books, right? And they were teaching me how, you know, oh, we don't need God. The, every, this is, everything just kind of naturally evolved and all this kind of stuff. He said, I just stopped believing in God. And I thought, man, can you imagine the Christians, good Christians, sending their kids, right, to these public schools and they're learning bad behaviors from their peers and they're learning bad e education from, uh, from their teachers. And I'll say this, you know, if a, t if a Sunday school teacher in a church abuses a kid, all over the news, right? You're going to hear about that. This one case is going to be all over the news. You know, kids get abused in public school all the time, right. sexually abused. Teachers hit on their kids. I mean, even especially teenagers and stuff like that. And they, and they do all kinds of, uh, of things. Not only the, that, but mental abuse, making fun of kids or even sometimes physical, physical abuse they are caught. Uh, they can't control their anger and so they act out on the kids or something like that. Look, it happens all over and yet the government forces them to go to public school, right? But if they go to, if that happens in a, in a, in a church, all of a sudden it's like all oh, churches need to be shut down. They're just abusing kids and all this kind of stuff. Look, this is why the parents have the responsibility to protect their kids. The parents need to make sure the kids are getting the right education, all those kinds of things. But look, we, we, we want to help parents. We just don't want it to ever have a chance that the church is actually the place where the child goes downhill. There's been a lot of camps. I like church camp. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I think it has its place. But a lot of times at church camps, you get this young uh, kid that's called a youth pastor. He doesn't know the first thing about being a pastor, <laughs> you know, or leading kids in the right direction. He's a young man. He's a youth pastor. And, uh, and he comes in here and he's trying to be cool with all the teenagers and all that kind of stuff. And they go to camp and, and, and he ends up teaching and doing all kinds of things, uh, you know, and, gets, and, and just sometimes even gets a camp shut down or something like that because of some stupid mistakes that he made. I don't want that to be on my record or my conscience of being a pastor of a church that I allowed some kid to be mistreated that way. So this is why we want to really teach that parents are responsible for their kids and they keep them and take care of them. But uh, how do we, oh, okay, so I talked about kids are so easily deceived. Also, they have no inhibitions. They won't, nothing will stop them. I mean, you know, they'll just go out there and do whatever. They're not afraid. Nothing's going to, nothing's going to harm me. And so, uh, and so they'll, they'll do that. Okay. <clears throat> So what, what is, how, how is it that, uh, that we as a church can help uh, and what can we supply to the, to the uh, children? So knowing that Jesus loved the little children, 
we can know that the Lord is working in their hearts and their lives. The next blank is this, since it's ultimately the parent's responsibility to raise the children, we need to focus on providing help to the parents. And that's the thing that always bothered me. I was like, man, if I see kids coming in and great, we're filling up the buses and getting kids in there to, you know, yeah, we're bribing them with candy and all this stuff. But at least they're coming in to the church and we can preach the gospel. And I'll say, praise the Lord, a lot of kids got saved that way. Uh, so there's no bus ministry uh, as a whole isn't just evil. But what I what bothered me is I was seeing that parents were just using it as a babysitter. And they were like, oh, I don't care. You know, you can go to your church. Uh, Sunday is my me time, right? I, I don't work on that day and it's my, my me time. But yeah, you can take my kids. I'll have some free time without the kids. And sometimes we capitalize on that and be like, well, okay, yeah, great. We'll take them. And then I'm thinking, hey, well, at least we can preach them the gospel and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, but now what we've done is we've showed the parents, right? We'll take care of your kids for you. You don't have a responsibility to raise these kids. And how many think that those kids are going to continue? Now, praise the Lord if they get saved, okay? I understand that. That's another subject. But how many think they're going to continue in church? It certainly isn't the statistics that I see. I have not seen, in fact, a lot of studies have been shown that if a child begins going to church at a young age, it is almost statistically an impossibility that they are going to continue in church. Now you say, well, I've heard stories. Yeah, but here's the, here's the rare occasions that you hear that. You have a youth pastor or a pastor or somebody in the church that practically adopted that kid and dragged him to church and went to their house and got him out of bed and got him clothed and all that stuff and invested so much in their life that they were like a second parent to the kids. All right. You, it, it, that's an, an impossibility for the church to invest that much in the kids on a regular basis in hopes that the kids would continue with the Lord. What would be much more effective is if we could just reach the parents. Amen. I'm not saying it's always going to happen, but if we could reach the parents and help the parents and say, no, I want your kids to come to church, but you need to bring them. They need to see, you know, uh, what an adult is supposed to look like. And uh, it's, it's hard, it's difficult, but that's what you have to do uh, to really be the most help that you can be. And so as a church, that's what we need to remember uh, is this the parents' responsibility, so we want to help the parents. How do we accomplish this? Number one, we need to assure the parents that they are capable of providing for and that they must provide for their own. Uh, we're directly talking about infants and toddlers here. They need to be providing for them. They need them. They need them, and they can take care of them. Look, so many adults, you know why so many adults right now are just bad parents? Because they had bad parents. A lot of times, that's what it is. The adults, they didn't learn from their parents, and so now they're trying to raise kids. And uh, you know what I'm seeing a lot of, uh, uh, is really common right now? That the parents aren't even around. The grandparents are raising the kids. The same parents who obviously did a bad job raising their kids, right, are now raising their grandkids. How many think they're going to be better parents now? <laughs> grandparents, man, they, grandparents don't want to discipline their grandkids, right? And so, so man, it's just one generation after another. <laughs> uh, so one generation after another, and they're, and they're just so, uh, you know, messed up because they don't have good instruction, good biblical teaching of how to properly raise their children. Now, it's so funny because I know this isn't always the case, but I've seen it in so many people's face, not my family, but just so many Christians that I've seen where the world says, how do you do it? I mean, how do you get your kids to behave? And, you know, oftentimes we've had people say that in the past, and I'm like, they don't know that just like 10 minutes ago in the car, we were like, will you all stop fighting <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. But they're looking at these kids and saying, man, compared to the average kid that I see today, these kids, man, are just perfect little angels. And, uh, and, and, and people just would come out and say that. And I'm thinking, no, they still have a long ways to go. We still got a lot of work to put into them and stuff like that. And then you start telling people, these people that are like, man, your kids are so well behaved. How do you do it? And then you start telling them, well, you know, at a young age, uh, we had to show them who's boss. And, and if they started misbehaving, we'd have to spank them. And these people are like, oh. Like, you're such an evil parent. <laughs> Wait, just a few minutes ago, you said, how do you get your children? They just love you so much, and your children are always hugging you and loving you, and they're obeying you. How did you do that? And then you say, well, we did it the biblical way, right? We disciplined them, spanked them whenever they needed it, and they're just like, oh, how could you do that? That's so evil. That's so wicked, right? That's just the world not understanding. 
They don't understand it, so somebody needs to teach them that. How are we going to do that? We've got to get the parents under the preaching. And then they have to know uh, what the Bible says. And, they, and it's hard sometimes because you know that when you say that, it's not going to be popular. But they have to hear that kind of preaching. And so we need to figure out ways to provide them with that. It needs to be preached regularly. Uh, and of course, in a church, the more families that a church has, the more you'll hear this kind of stuff preached. You know, in a church, uh, when I'm preaching in Iola, I hardly ever preach on raising kids <laughs> because we're the only ones, uh, for the most part, that have kids. Now we're seeing some come in now that do, but, uh, but so, so, you know, the more families you have, the more that church is probably really going to be able to minister to families that have kids. All right, and so that's a, a, a blessing. And so as we as a church see more families coming in, the, uh, the burden of raising their infants and toddlers and church is, uh, is given to the parents. Okay, and so, so we don't want to uh, give in to all the divided classes. That's your next blanks there. We don't want to give in to the divided classes during the regular preaching service. This is a huge temptation, and I myself I go back and forth so many times, and I'm like, yeah, but when they're in the service and they're hearing the preaching, words and thoughts are going over their head, and they're not getting it. They need to hear something at their own level, and this is why there's divided Sunday school classes and all this kind of stuff. But number one, you'd be amazed at what kids are picking up at a very young age in the service. And just sitting there listening, they're learning, even if they're not understanding the words, they're learning. They're learning how to behave. They're learning how to sit through that. They're learning by watching the adults and how they, how they behave and how they act. And so it's important to get the children into the church. But you know what happens? You get a visitor that comes in, and they have children, and they're like, hey, do you have a nursery or something for my kid? Not all, but some, some do that because they're thinking there's no way my kid's going to behave through the entire service. And if you say, no, we don't, have, I, get, I get emails quite frequently, actually, that says, hey, do you guys have a, young, uh, a children's program or, or a nursery and all that kind of stuff? And when I say, no, we all just kind of go into the services together, I never see those people <laughs> a lot of times because they're like, oh, man, I need, a, I, I, can't, I need to go keep my focus on the preaching, right? And somebody else needs to take my kids to the other room and speak on their level. And that seems to make sense in so many ways, but, you know, you're messing up a lot of stuff when you do that. Because those parents need to learn how to raise their children in church. And how are they going to learn that? Well, number one, they got to do it, right? right? Which means if there's other families in the church, you know, and that couple, that uh, uh, new couple or single mom, whatever the case, it comes in and they're visiting and they got a bunch of kids, it's very, very important that they see families right? Sitting together where the kids are sitting down and they're listening to the preacher and they're doing all that. That's going to help that, uh, that visitor immensely because they're going to say, wow, it can be done, right? Number one, how do you do that? They're going to start asking questions. I know, how, how can you help me do that? Okay. And so here's the other thing. Now, I know there's a lot of single guys in here and you don't have children maybe, or you don't know much about raising kids or keeping them in church. And so Here's what's important, too. You get a visitor in here with lots of kids, and maybe they're loud, maybe they're fighting, maybe they're playing around, doing all these kind of things, and that visitor thinks, it's a hopeless cause, man. <laughs> I'm never going to do this. Sometimes they won't come back because they're so embarrassed. My kids were so bad, and I, I just don't know what to do. And We can help. We can help. It's hard. It's hard not to get distracted. It's hard not to be like, man, that she needs to take those kids out and beat them or something. Like that. It's hard not to just think different things. And look, do whatever you can. But I think it's very important that a, 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 a parent that comes in as a visitor, they get encouragement, even from the single people, right? And here's how they get encouragement. If they're like, oh, my kid's misbehaving and they're uncomfortable and you can tell and they look over at, at, at a couple that's sitting over here or a single person or whatever, and they're just kind of like, <laughs> that's not going to be encouraging to them. They're going to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, right? <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of grandmas in Iola. And what they do whenever we have a couple comes in with the kid and the kid starts crying, and they mean well, okay, because for many years this is what they did. They're trying to be loving and helpful, but they'll go to them in the middle of the service while I was preaching. Or, you know, they, were, they used to do this. They don't do it so much anymore, but they would go to that couple with the parents and say, we have a nursery. Could I take the kid into the nursery with you? I understand the motivation. I understand where their heart is and why they're doing that. But you know what you're telling that parent? You're saying, 
hey, I can't hear what the preacher's saying. <laughs> and I love you and I want to help you. So here's how I'm going to help you. I'll take your kid out of here. No, they need to learn that the child can stay there and they can grow and they can learn with everybody else, even if it's difficult. You know, even if it gets loud, you hear sometimes churches that have a lot of kids in the service with them and you're like, man, how can that preacher keep preaching over all the crying and the noise and all that stuff? Look, it's good. It's good for everybody, really. And it's good, definitely going to be good for those kids and for those parents if they get, uh, uh, if they know that they're encouraged and accepted uh, into the service. Okay, so let's see here. So members should encourage visitors who are new at keeping their children in a service. Even members without children can encourage them by their response to the children. And by the way, it's good to smile at kids, right? Contrary to what some think, they're not just, you know, little germ spreading crumb munchers, <laughs> right? Crawling around. Look, they're, they're human beings and they're impressionable and they're learning and growing. And so it's good to smile at them, be nice to them. Hey, it's not awkward. If you're nice to a kid, we're not going to think you're a reprobate. I mean, don't get too nice. But <laughs> if you're nice to a kid, you're smiling, you're saying, hey, how are you doing? You know, obviously don't break the comfort zone and break the parents' trust that way either. But, uh, but it's not wrong to talk to kids. That, uh, kids are, are craving that, actually. They want... Uh, I'm going to get to that here in a second with the young children. I keep kind of going back and forth. I was supposed to be talking primarily about infants. but Okay, so here's another thing we can do is we can help equip parents for this task by providing good books, articles, and uh, videos that might talk about this subject, obviously biblical-based and, 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 and good scriptures and stuff like that. But uh, we know some good videos that are made and documentaries and stuff like that that will help parents with some of these things. Uh, we can provide those resources, encourage them, share stuff with them. Uh, another good thing, getting together with other families, okay, for specific uh, activities or maybe a special class where the parents and the kids uh, uh, maybe will be there together in a, in a different setting, but the parents are still there. It's for the parents to teach the kids, all right? So number two, the young children, okay, the stage of realizing, realizing. And I'll try to move along a little bit here. At this point, the children begin to understand how things work. And they actually have a desire to learn. Children, it's amazing at, what, at such a young age. Think about how fast they learn language. right? Don't you wish you could learn a foreign language as fast as kids pick it up? They're just learning nonstop every day. Just tons of information just being loaded into their little brains. And, uh, and so they're learning all this and they're trying to sort things out trying to uh, 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 figure them out. They have a, actually a desire to learn. Now, here's what's funny is what we do during that stage of their life, and it's easy, it makes sense, this is the way we've been taught. What we'll do is we'll dumb things down for them because we'll think, oh, well, they're just little children. We need to speak on their level, and we'll dumb things down. Another thing we'll do, and I, there's a time and a place for this, of course, but we'll use object lessons, right? Some, teach, some children's ministries will do like magic tricks they won't call it magic but they'll do some kind of magic tricks or or uh you know object lessons and they'll be very very simplistic and I understand that, that the young kids are still learning things uh and they're very simple in some of their understanding but actually what has been found out is that kids can understand just the point blank truth right you just tell them the facts and they're soaking these facts up and they're gaining them and actually Adults respond better to the object lessons and stuff like that because they can make that symbolism and they can say, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Or kids like, what do you mean Jesus is in my heart? Jesus is in my heart. <laughs> you know, what do you mean? Uh, the, these simple things that we use and we're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I get the metaphor right there and kids are just like, man, just give me the facts. Right. And so kids are just absorbing these facts and we need to give we just need to tell them stories teach them songs, teach them Bible verses. They can memorize scripture like you wouldn't believe uh, young kids can. And so these are the types of things that they, uh, they need to be doing. All right, because they have this desire to learn, but of course, we also know this, on their own, kids are naturally not going to learn right things. <laughs> they have a desire to learn, but what do they have a desire to learn? They, well, they want to learn how to be bad. <laughs> They want to learn the bad words. Kids can pick up those kinds of words <laughs> real fast, right? Uh, they want to learn things uh, in behaviors and, and, and dances and all this kind of stuff uh, that we don't want them to learn, but they're just they're soaking everything up. 
unfortunately, they don't just pick out the good things. It's our responsibility to make sure they're being bombarded with the education of good things in their life. And it'll make a long lasting. Any of those in this room that grew up as a young kid, I know Brother Dan was that way, and a kid in the ministry, uh, in churches, I think Stevie's were too as well, learning Bible verses, learning uh, uh, just the, the songs and all that kind of stuff. Man, that stuff sticks with you your whole life. You memorize these verses, John 3, 16, boom, just comes right out. If you don't start learning it until you're older, it's hard. It's hard to, to get all those committed to memory. So really important that we understand that the kids are craving to learn at that young uh, child stage, but the parents need to see to it that they do learn the right things. Remember Psalm uh, 29, 15 says, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. He's, he, they can't just go do, even as adults, really, if your boss just says, you know what? I'm not going to give you any instructions today. Just do whatever you think needs to be done. Probably nothing's going to get done because <laughs> everyone's going to do what they want to do. Well, I've been wanting to get this thing done. I've been wanting to, and I remember that in the ministry. I'm not blaming uh, my father-in-law, but I remember whenever I was working under him, there's a lot of times he didn't want to give me things to do because he felt like he would be annoying to me or something like that. And so he, he would just kind of leave me to do a lot of things on my own. And so I would do things that weren't even that super important, but I liked doing them, right? And then I found out later, man, I should have been focusing on doing, you know, more important things. And, and, uh, and somebody that they're not necessarily easy things to do or things that you want to do, but somebody needs to say, hey, this is what you need to do. And uh, even though you're like, oh, I don't know, no, you need to do this now. And if you don't do a good job, they're going to hold you accountable to it. We all need that. Kids definitely need that because I guarantee you, if you let them eat whatever they want, they're not going to eat their veggies. <laughs> You let them go play wherever they want to play. They're going to play in the worst possible place, and they're going to get in trouble and all that kind of stuff. That's our human nature, so we need to guide them and direct them into the right place. They also have a desire to please others and to receive attention. And a lot of times we take that as a negative thing, and it, obviously we don't want to build up a, a child's pride and give them a, a, you know, a bad lead them in a, in a bad uh, uh, direction of, of pride and just like look at me and all my talents and stuff like that. But kids do like getting attention and they do want to please others. And it's, and it's a healthy thing sometimes. Look at Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is talking about, the, uh, about John the Baptist And in verse 16, well, let me see here. <clears throat> yeah, he's saying, uh, he's saying in John the Baptist, uh, some people say, you know, John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a devil, and the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. So in order to combat that, here's the, the, what Jesus said. He said, behold, uh, I mean, but wherefore shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lament lamented. And so he's saying, look, the way you're treating us, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus, when John the Baptist comes and he's just, you know, eating locusts and honey and, he, and he's just, you know, they say, man, that guy's got a devil. Look at him. You know, he's not eating enough. And then Jesus comes and he's sitting down and he's going to people's houses and he's preaching to them over dinner and he's eating food and uh, drinking grape juice. And they're like, look, there's a wine bibber and a, and a glutton, right? And so he's saying, hey, you are just like the children that sit in the marketplace, which kind of tells me that this was something that they would have all been familiar with. Children sitting in the market, marketplace wanting to play their instruments, all right? And they're playing their instruments and they're saying, and they're playing a joyful song. And they're like, hey, it'd be really great if some person just came over here. I'm ad-libbing a lot, okay? Uh, if some person came over here to the sound of that music and just started dancing, you know, and said, oh, wow, that's so happy music, you know? In fact, but instead, they come by, like, looking at these kids, like, why are you playing such happy music? <laughs> what do you think? You know, what are you, you're just being kids. Grow up, right? So the kids say, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Then we'll play mournful music, you know? <laughs> 
and their doo -doo, I don't know what a lamentation song a lament uh, uh, sounds like, but anyway, some mournful song. And then so then they come through the uh, marketplace and the, man, why are you so you know playing such a downer? I mean, come on, play something a little more cheerful, right? And so he's using that. So you know, I think in my mind that they're saying like these were kids sitting there, and I think Jesus is creating a situation that in my mind I see kids all the time, and I'm like, man, that's exactly how kids are. Kids are like, you know, hey, why don't you join me? Uh, while we're, Brother Dan and I, uh, I try to be a good silent partner. And if I can distract the children's attention so the child doesn't interrupt while someone's trying to preach the gospel, you know, I try to do that. But sometimes when I do that, I'm like, oh, that's going to be a bigger distraction because the parents are going to be watching the kids playing with this stranger, you know. And so I was trying to figure out what to do. But this little girl was trying so hard to get my attention. And she's playing and she's wanting me to watch her and she's wanting to show me all her toys and all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to be a distraction. And so, but look, the kids are just craving, hey, somebody play with me. Somebody give me attention. Somebody recognize what I can do. They're like, hey, watch me do a somersault. That's not a somersault. <laughs> don't be like that. Just be, oh, wow, good try. You know, you're trying to, they want encouragement. They want attention. And I believe it's important. And I think this is kind of the way that Jesus handled kids. Uh, that the children be received, okay? They, they want to be received, and I think it's good for them to be received. Let them know that they're welcome here, uh, and we want them here, and they provide a good atmosphere. And I'm telling you, they do. Right. They do, because in, in, in Iola, we would go a long time without seeing any children. And I love our folks. They're good folks. They love the Lord. They're, there's a good spirit in the church. Uh, but, man, when a child walks in, it's like everyone's day just brightens, right? And everyone's smiling. It's kind of hard to preach then because everyone's looking around to see what the children are doing. But, but that's good. It's a good feeling It's to know those children are there. To hear the children get up and say memory verses or to sing a song or something like that, man, that's, that's encouraging and it's exciting. And parents uh, and, and people like to see that. Okay, so a child does need to know their place. I'm not saying just let children do whatever they want whenever they want but they need encouragement. Now, oftentimes we'll find that in a child's life, when a child is discouraged a lot, and it seems like they just, they're always seeking attention, but they're not getting it. A lot of times what you'll find is it was lacking in the father. That attention was lacking in the father. Look at Ephesians 6. Colossians says something very similar. We're just going to go to Ephesians for the sake of time. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, verse 4. At, this is after saying, Children, obey your parents, right? Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, and they may live long upon the earth. And verse 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And a lot of different verses in the Bible show us, and they kind of speak to this, this fact where the parents... Uh, you know, when they're raising the kids, sometimes that father is just a little bit discouraging to them. I have to fight it, man, because I'm, I'm, and it got, God put this in the Bible for a reason. Okay, and I, as a father, sometimes, I don't mean to be, but my kids will come to me, right, and they'll just be trying to show me something, or, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe they mowed the yard, or they did the weed eating, or something like that. And my first tendency is to be like, man, did you even do anything over here? Like, what? Give me that weed eater. Let me show you how to do it, right? Man, that's discouraging, right? I want to try not to do that. Uh, it, yes, they do need to learn how to do it, but they need to be doing it in such a way that we don't discourage them. And, uh, and uh, let, let's just go to Colossians, because I, I don't remember how it said, but Colossians 3.21 says the same thing. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Okay, we don't want to discourage our kids or make them angry, angry kids. Uh, I've known kids that hate their parents. Growing up, I remember teenagers saying, I hate my parents. And I remember they'd listen to heavy music, all day, uh, heavy metal music all day long. And it just like built up this anger in them. I, I can see pictures of so many of my friends growing up and they're like, I hate my parents. And you know what it was? It was just like they never met their parents' approval. Their parents would just always shut down everything that they do and they didn't show them attention or any love and it messed up the children. We don't want to do that. And you can do this study on your own, but study all the examples in the Bible of kids that turned out bad. And oftentimes there was something lacking in the father there and the attention that they showed to the kids. Remember uh, when you were little, you did show and tell. Anybody do show and tell in school? Remember that? I remember doing that. You bring something and you just wanted to show it to everybody and you'd get up in front of the 
class and you know, kids probably didn't really care, <laughs> but it was an opportunity for you to share something with your life. I think kids have a desire to do that. Young children have a desire to do that. And I say, let them do it. You know, it's good. Show us what you made. Show us that song that you can sing. Uh, show us that memory verse that you, uh, that you memorized. And I think we can incorporate that somehow. I haven't figured this all out, but this is something I think that we could do and incorporate into the church this opportunity for kids to be able to demonstrate uh, what they've done. And let's just, you know, let them do it. And, 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 and uh, we don't want to build their pride too much, but we do want to be able to show them that we love them and that they're accepted. Okay, allow them to share their memory verses. And uh, I think it's great to go on family outings where the, the kids get to actually be with mom and dad together and, and to do things with them and to be able to get the attention and the affection from them. And I was thinking about this, this group of children that I'm talking about, this, this, this age group. Not the toddlers, they tend to get a lot of attention. But after that, when a lot of kids are neglected and all that kind of stuff, I was thinking about this, this quarantine time that's going on. Those are the kids that are probably thriving the best during all this, right? Because they're seeing more mommy and daddy at home and they're, and they're like, hey, this is great. And they're getting to do things with them and stuff like that. Young kids need that. And so as a church, I think this is just some basics about some of these, uh, some of these attributes of kids and, and how, you know, things that we need to think about. Because I really want to uh, see this work, you know, filled up with families that have kids. And that's going to be so healthy and it's going to be so helpful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then instead of singing, I want to share something with you <clears throat> right afterwards. Lord, I love you and uh, thank you for all that you've uh, done for this church and in our lives individually. I know in my life, Lord, the blessings that you've given of, of late even and then just since this work started. And, and uh, Lord, you know what's best for us all. You know what's best for this church. Lord, help us to honor your word and to seek what your will and your way is that we might not get off track and, and do the wrong things. Uh, but Father, help us to do our best, Lord, should you uh, uh, tarry, that we would do our best to uh, raise a future generation of kids that love you and uh, are firm uh, and, uh, and steadfast on your word. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.